Okay, today is a snow day. We would have been having a class on the topic of data wrangling. I'm going to use this video to show you a few things we would have talked about in class and to get you set up to attempt the assignment for this week, even though we won't have had a lecture on it. We'll go over all of these things uh, when we meet next time. So data wrangling is a process that covers many things, uh, how to load data into R, how to format data into different um, ways of structuring the data. And we're going to spend a lot of time in this uh, assignment looking at the dplyr package, which is a very useful package for filtering data, selecting different parts of it, and summarizing data sets. Here's some references and resources for you to learn more about dplyr. Check those out. And one of the things we would have talked about in class are these class notes on data wrangling. So let's just click on that. Uh, and I'll have you go through these details on your own. Um, but I'll talk ab about a few of these basics here. So you can read all of this. Um, I've got all of this as an RMD file, so I'm just going to load that up and we can look at it here. Here's the file that I made. The first thing we want to do is load the dplyr package. So I've got a chunk here, we're going to load that. If you haven't installed dplyr, then go over to packages, click install, type in dplyr, and install it with the dependencies. You can confirm that it's on by scrolling down and seeing there it is. I've made a comment here that dplyr comes with a data frame called Star Wars. It's true, if you just type in Star Wars after you've loaded the library, you'll see a data frame. So this line puts Star Wars into a variable called df. And let's take a look at it here. So what we see is a database of names of characters from different Star Wars movies. A lot of information about these characters, height, mass, hair color, skin color, eye color, and so on. Whenever there is unknown or missing data, we have an NA for that. And um, we can use this as an example set of data to look at uh, various things that dplyr can do for us. First thing is to get comfortable with basic data frame manipulation without dplyr. So for example, if I type df and a dollar sign, all of the columns show up as options. So if I type name after that and press enter, uh, we're returning just the column with uh, that information. So these, this would get the column for height, this would get the column for mass. Here, uh, we can address columns and rows without names using numbers. So this data frame has 87 observations, there's 87 rows, and there's 13 variables, or 13 columns. If I wanted to get the first row, I could do this. Um, use the square brackets. Whatever you put on the left side of the comma, is the row index and the right side is the column index. So this, this would get the first column and um, all of the rows. This would get the first four rows and all of the columns. Notice when there's nothing on the right side here, that just means all of the columns. Over here, there's nothing on the left side, that means all of the rows. If we wanted to get rows one to three, and columns six to seven, we could do it this way. We can also use logical indexing. So for example, if we wanted to get the row where Luke Skywalker is in the row under the column for name, we could do something like this. We write df, and then we're indexing into it. We're basically saying here, if the column name equals Luke Skywalker, 
That is, if, if a row in that column equals Luke Skywalker, then we're going to return the entire column. And so what we've done is returned Luke Skywalker, the height, the mass, the hair color, the skin color, and so on. Notice we didn't put anything on the column side, so it returns all of the columns. If we wanted to return all of the rows where the height value is greater than 180, we can do this. Now notice what's happened is um, for any row where the height, so here we're looking at the height column, is greater than 180, we're going to return all of the columns. We could have multiple selections here, so this one would return um, rows where height is less than 180 and greater than 70. We're using the AND operator there. We could also replace particular values, so this would re put a 173 into the cell at the first row, second column. We can figure out how big our data frame is using dim. We already know that it's 87 rows by 13 variables and dim returns the row first, then the column number. We can add columns to a data frame using CBind. That stands for column bind. Here you first put the data frame that you want to add to, then a comma, then you name, give the name of the new column. So this is going to be called random number. Then we use the equal sign. And here what I'm doing is I'm returning 87 random numbers between 0 and 1. So this part here, dim df1, dim df returns the 87 and the 13. I'm selecting the first output from here, so that's going to be 87. And this function, the first number is the number of uh, numbers to generate, so it would be 87 numbers. So if I run this, we can check that indeed we've added a column called random number to the end. It's possible to add new rows using the rbind function for row bind. And here what we're doing is we're saying, let's take rows one to two and all of the columns, and then add to the bottom of that rows five to six and all of the columns, and put all of that into a new variable called new df. So here we have something with the first two rows that we added and the second two rows that we added. Notice that in this data frame, which one is it? The species column, and we can see that if we click here and go down and look at species, we've got different characters, human, droid, droid, human, coding the species of each character. We can turn that into a factor using as.factor. When we do that, species now changes to a factor with 37 levels. The levels refer to each of the unique codes in that column. If you want to rename a particular factor, so this one would find the third one, which is one, two, three, the Syrian, and here we could rename that by putting something into it. So if we retyped levels, we'd see the third one's being renamed hello. Okay, so using all of this logical indexing, we can do some data wrangling. We can start to answer different kinds of questions. So consider this question. What are the names of all the characters who are taller than 80 and shorter than 140 and are female? So we can find our data frame df. Now we're using a very large uh, set of logical indices. All of this is inside the square brackets. We're saying the height must be greater than 80, then an and. 
the height must be less than 170, and another and, and the gender must equal female. So it's going to return all the rows where all of these three things are true. And we've also put a comma here. So this is referring to row information. And on the right side of the comma, we haven't put anything. So it's going to return all of the columns for us. However, we only want the names. So I've put dollar sign name and we get the names back. Notice there's some NAs in here and uh, we will deal with NAs later. So how many characters have Tatooine for their home world? One way to do this would be to um, first of all get all, all the rows where the home world is Tatooine and this would actually just print all of those out here. If we wanted to get the dimensions of this new data frame and count the rows, we could do something like this, and we get 20. However, you might have noticed that this output um, contains some NA values, so the count is inaccurate. Uh, the next code shows an example of removing the NAs, so we get a count of 10. Okay, so so far we've done some logical indexing of data frames and we haven't used dplyr at all. Well, dplyr is a package that allows us to do many of those same things in a convenient way and with a slightly different syntax. We'll be using that package and we'll be learning something about or something called the pipe operator, which looks like this to a percentage sign, um, a greater than sign, and another percentage sign. Here's basically what we're going to be doing with data uh, in many examples in the class. We'll take some data and then we'll want to um, submit it to various transformations. In this example, we're taking the data, then we're filtering it, then we're grouping it, then we're summarizing it. These pipe, operator, pipe operators are um, like a chain. You put the data frame into the first pipe that filters it, you take the output of that, put it into the next pipe that groups it, you take the output of that, you put it to the next pipe that summarizes it. So let's take a look at an example. Here, uh, we've already loaded dplyr. This will be necessary to run this bit of code. What we're doing is we're taking our data frame called df. Then we're going to filter it so that all of the numbers in the height column are greater than 100. Then we're going to group by the column home world which has a bunch of home worlds. And lost my place here. Okay. And then we're going to compute uh, a new variable called mean birth year. And we'll uh, get the mean of the values in the birth year column. We're going to remove all of the NAs. So the result of this operation is a new data frame called new DF. Let's take a look at it. And what we have is for every home world, we've calculated the mean birth year of all the characters that came from these various home worlds. So let's look at a few more examples. First of all, filter. We're going to break this down. If we run this little bit of code, we would take our original data frame and filter the rows so that um, we include only rows where in the height column 
the number was greater than 120. So you can see here we've got a restricted data frame. There's 73 names in it, and all of the heights are greater than 120. So if we went down the column for height, we wouldn't see any less than 120. So we're filtering that. We can have multiple filters, and those are separated by commas inside the filter function. So here we're saying, let's keep all the rows where in the height column, they're greater than 120, less than 180, and the birth year column that is greater than 20. So if we look at our data frame now, there's only 17 rows where those conditions are met. So we could filter uh, the gender column, keeping all the rows that are equal to male. We could filter that column, um, keeping all the rows that are not equal to male. We could select for multiple properties, um, filter the column where the values in the eye color column are blue or yellow. We can use greater than or equal to. We can have multiple filters doing it this way rather than having a, col a comma. And we can also use the OR operator if we want. So that is a convenient way to select rows based on various characteristics. Dplyr also lets us summarize our data using, um, well, let's talk about this. The group by function and the summarize function. The group by function lets us grab parts of the data based on levels in the column. And the summarize function applies a function to each of the groups that are created. So let's look at this first part here. Run that. We're taking all of the original data we're saying let's group by hair color. And then in our summarize function, we're creating a new variable called counts. And that's going to be um, length name. So what's happening here is the data frame is being split up into different groups based on hair color. For every Star Wars character, um, for each hair color, uh, each of those characters have a name. So we're getting the length, which is the number of characters in each group, and we're putting that into the counts. So if we looked at this uh, new data frame, here's what we would see. There is one character with auburn hair color, one with auburn gray, one with auburn white, 13 with black, three with blonde, etc. 37 with none. We can keep adding more groups. So what if we wanted to know the counts as a function of hair color and eye color? Well, now we can see there's um, one character with auburn hair and blue eyes. And if we can go on, go on down and see the other combinations. So for black hair, brown eyes, there's nine of them. Blonde hair, blue eyes, three of them, and so on. Summarize is a very powerful tool because we can write our own functions or use existing functions. For example, um, here we're grouping by hair color and eye color, and we're computing the mean birth year, putting that in a variable called mean years. We're computing the standard deviation of the birth year and the counts. So if we do this, we will see uh, the grouping labels for hair color and eye color, as well as the mean years, the standard deviation of the years, if that could be computed, and the counts and everything. We could use mutate to add to or change a column. So for example, here uh, we do the mutate call and we're going to change the column named height 
we're going to change it to all the values in that column minus 100. So that will subtract 100 from all of the values in the column height. Let's say we want to make a new column that divides all the numbers in the height column by the mass column. We could call that the HM ratio, and uh, this mutate function would do that. We can also use the select function to select columns of interest and return a data frame only with those columns. So if we did this, select name height mass, we'll get a data frame with three columns in it. Name, height, and mass. All right. You can go through some of these Star Wars questions and answers. It shows um, using dplyr to answer a few of these questions. And as you can see, we always start with the data frame and then we keep on adding different pipes to select group by and do something, to select group by and summarize. All right. Um, you can review this part on data input. I'll go over that momentarily as we talk about the assignment. There's many ways to read in data to R uh, for particular situations. Now, if we go back, um, here's what's in store for the assignment. First of all, I want to show you an example R Markdown Analysis Report. We're starting to get into um, data analysis, and R is great for this because we can create these kinds of reports. So here is a, an example analysis of some data showing you a bunch of steps along the way that are common in data analysis. So for example, you will have to load the libraries you're going to use. Then you're going to have to load the data into R. Generally, there will be pre-processing. This will involve structuring the data into the format you need, you need it to be in. Often we want to do checks on the data, find out if there's the correct number of subjects, if the data has mistakes or doesn't have mistakes. Um, so here what we're seeing is these steps as well as our code that uh, performs these steps. Oftentimes you will exclude data. We could use dplyr to filter data for our exclusions. In this example, we're not going to exclude any data. Um, and what we had here was some data from a Stroop experiment. If you wanted to learn more about this particular data set, you can click this link here and it will take you to uh, the stats lab manual that goes over this in more detail. But basically, once we have the data in, uh, what we're going to do is get some means for each of the important conditions. And as you can see, we use dplyr to do that. We also got the standard error of the means. Uh, and we made a nice table. We use ggplot to plot the means. And in this case, the experiment was a repeated measures design. And so we can use R to do a repeated measures ANOVA and return the output of that ANOVA. And then we can create this R Markdown document that uh, identifies all of the steps we took in processing our data, as well as the output of the analysis. Next week, we'll start talking about st statistics and ANOVAs and things like that. For now, uh, your assignment is going to be to load in some data and then uh, get some means, make some tables, and make some figures. So this is just an example analysis uh, that we'll be working towards creating. Okay, so your R Markdown assignment is right here. If you click this link, you'll download an RMD file that you can edit. Here is the answer sheet for the assignment. This is what I'm asking you to produce. Um, it's an analysis of something called a Flinker experiment. You will have to load the data in the libraries you will use 
do some pre-processing and at the end of the day you're going to produce a few of these tables. There's a table, there's this table, this plot, and uh, this plot, and these tables and plots. So as you make these things you can check your numbers here to see if they're correct. So briefly, let's open up the assignment file and take a look at it. So this is called Data Wrangle Flanker Student. Now I've written notes in here to explain this task to you. And I've got you started uh, with loading the data. First off, you'll need to get the data and that's available through this link. I downloaded this zip file and I've placed a folder inside my R Markdown project, which I can see right here, inside the folder Flanker Data. And if we click on that, we'll see there are 22 text files. If you open up one of the text files, you'll see we have a bunch of data. Uh, there's no column headers. In this task, people are shown a stimulus like this one on screen, say three Ds, and they're asked to identify the center letter as quickly and accurately as possible. So the first column is showing you what the stimulus was. The last column is showing you what the participant said with their response. So they press the D button. That's a correct trial. These two numbers will allow you to compute the reaction time. The first number is the computer time for when the stimulus appeared. The second number is the computer time for when the response was made. So the difference between these two numbers is how fast a person responded on that trial. Notice all four of these are called C's. That's because these are, on this one too, these are all compatible trials where the middle letter is the same as the outside letters. These are also called the flanker letters because they flank the middle letter. Generally performance is faster for congruent or compatible trials like this. Half of the trials also involve incompatible trials where the middle letter is different from the distracting flanker letters. Performance is generally slower on these incompatible trials. I've given you some sample code to show you how to pull in all of these files, load them individually into a data frame. We're calling that data frame one subject. And then there's a loop here that binds, row binds all of those individual data frames into one large data frame. So if we run this first part, we get a data frame called one subject. I've added labels to the columns so you can try to figure out what the columns mean. Um, and here we have data for, uh, oh, this is just one subject. I'll just scroll down and find this one. It's called all data. As you can see, it has 4,224 rows, 12 variables. So if we keep scrolling, we're seeing all of the data for subject one. Once we get to the end of subject one's data, we'll load up number 10 next because that's the next one in our file folder. Then it will go to 11 and so on. All right, so you will have to do these following steps. First of all, compute the accuracy on each trial and then create a new column that codes whether the response in each trial was correct or incorrect. Then you'll have to compute the reaction time on each trial. Put your code here to do that. Um, then you'll have to do some checks on the data. We're going to do some exclusion. So we're going to exclude all reaction times on single trials that are longer than 2000 milliseconds. Then we're going to do some 
analysis. So the first problem is get the individual subject mean reaction times um, for correct responses for both congruent and incongruent trials. Then get the overall mean reaction times and standard errors of the mean for the congruent and incongruent conditions and make a table and a graph. Then compute the Flanker effect for each subject, taking the difference between their mean incongruent and congruent RTs. Then plot the mean Flanker effect along with the standard error of the mean of the Flanker effect. Finally, there's an exploratory analysis um, that you can read through and attempt your answer here. Okay, so that's our snow day lecture. Uh, try to do these things before next class, and we will, of course, go over all of these things uh, as a way of making up for this snow day. And good luck.